nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. And we'll continue to discuss the notion of energy bands, but hopefully today we'll be talking about real crystals. I shouldn't use the word real because what we had been discussing in the past uh, few days Actually, those concepts also apply to one-dimensional and two-dimensional crystals as well, which are, of course, as real. But uh, for three dimensions, uh, which is most widely used, uh, our discussion today part relates to that, uh, three-dimensional crystals. So we'll talk about EK diagram and constant energy surfaces, two concepts that we have uh, uh, come to learn in last class in lecture six, talk about how to characterize EK diagram, that is how to measure them. You see, we are learning all sorts of complicated theory, but in practice, often you'll have to go to the lab and make this measurement. And these two notions, band gap and effective mass, at the end of the day, all these complicated calculations that we are doing, Schrodinger equations and EK diagram in various directions and all others, these two are the only concept that we'll have to carry forward in order to understand transistors, MOSFETs, and other things. So out of all this, that will be the final distilled concepts that we'll have to carry through. Remember the original problem? Once again, I want to come back to this often so that you don't forget in the math, the class, uh, this, this dense math of different things, the main purpose and the main purpose being the number of electrons that we calculate, free electrons that we calculate, simply by multiplying the number of atoms with number of electrons per atom that do not really support the conductivity measurements. And as a result, we are trying to see where the electrons sit and why they do not all contribute equally. Now, you already know the answer a little bit, right? Because remember the one bands that are full, Although they may have a lot of electrons sitting there, they carry zero current. So you can see immediately the huge fraction of the electrons, although they are there, they are really not participating in the conduction. So we shouldn't really think about them. So you can begin to see the outline of why the conductivity of different material, depending on their band structure, could be quite different because the fraction of electrons available for conduction. Now, Let's start with 3D, again, repeat the process exactly that way we did it for 1 and 2D. This is a, let's say, a real space cubic lattice, and only real life material that has this cubic lattice is, you remember, polonium, right? So that has only that one. Of course, silicon and gallium arsenide don't have this structure. But in any case, you can st get started here. If this is the real space, how should I construct the reciprocal space? Well, A is the lattice spacing, all three sides, and so we should make it 2 pi over A, right? 4 pi over A, 6 pi over A in the positive direction, and of course in the negative direction, minus 2 pi over A, minus 4 pi over A, X, Y, and Z in three directions. And once we do that, we'll get a corresponding lattice, but now in the wave vector space for the three-dimensional crystal as well. Now, of course, you realize this is going in all three directions, of course, but cubic lattice, so they are equally spaced in this particular case. Had it been a rectangular type lattice, parallelopiped, in that case, this would be slightly different. Again, how do you make the Brillouin zone? you will have to do the Wigner site algorithm, but on the reciprocal lattice, you know that. And that gives you essentially one, this a section which goes from zero to plus pi over A and zero to minus pi over A in each side, right? And in, it is three dimensions. So it goes in all three dimensions. So I have a little cube 
sit centered on one of the points sort of bisecting by planes which are perpendicular to the connectors to the neighboring points. So that's my building zone for cubic lattice. Now one thing I want to mention here that al although I have drawn this entire cube and we know that this is where all the solution would reside, right? Do you remember that all the equations, all the energy levels that we talk about are going to stay within this region, within these k vectors. Now one point is that you remember when we classified the crystal, we classified them in seven types. This monoclinic, cubic, remember? There's seven types. Now remember at that point I said that the cube has the maximum degree of symmetry. You can rotate it 90 degrees and still you get the same thing. You can reflect it around a mirror plane, get the same thing. You can invert it, take a point in R and just bring it to minus R. Then you get the same thing. In fact, there are 48 operations you can do on a cube that gives you back the same thing. So that says actually you just need 148 of the Brillouin zone to describe your whole solution because of the degree of symmetry. Just like in 1D, you could just go with 0 to pi over a. That is all the information you need to keep, right? Because just in that one dimensional plane, you just have mirror reflection. But here you have 48 reflections or 48 symmetries. So therefore, in this case, you just need 148. So even this, you do not need. Just 148 of a little wedge is all that information that you need. Okay. Now in real life, of course, we said that the carbon uh, diamond uh, lattice in silicon or germanium or gallium arsenide, then in that case, this becomes a face centered lattice with, if I combine the corner point and the one fourth down the diagonal the atom, right? Do you remember those two, if I form a basis, then it becomes a face centered, face centered lattice. And you realize by doing the homework, that if I take the left hand corner point, the blue left hand corner point, then connecting it to uh, let's say 6, 3 and 2, those are the lattice vectors for the primitive cell, the homework one that you just did. And so you can see the reciprocal lattice in this case, which you're not going to calculate, but you could if you just use that algorithm, it will not be simply 2 pi over a. Because A is not the primitive cell, remember, the A is sort of a unit cell, but it's not the primitive cell. So in this case, the from, you see, going from the corner point to 3, this is be related to A over 2, something like this. And so therefore, the corresponding reciprocal lattice you do, if you do, it will not look like the cubic one. You see, it will look like a little bit more complicated. Now, the first thing you notice that the age of this is not pi over a to minus pi over a because the atoms are actually closer together. It's not pi a apart in general. As a result, the first thing you will notice is it is as if it is pi over a over 2. Pi over a over 2 because the a over 2 is actually close to the spacing point. And so the age of the Brillouin zone in this case is 2 pi over a not pi over a as we have seen before. And then this looks a little complicated. That's not really a major point, but I want to point out a few things here and that it will get clarified a little bit later also. The center point, the center of the Brillouin zone in this case has a name, gamma point. So we'll say that, and if you go in the kx, ky direction, you will hit a square rhombus surface on one of the one of the planes. Remember, they are just doing Wigner's sight algorithm based on the inverse lattice. So therefore, you see all these planes, and the point where it hits it is called a x point. You can see here x point, and how many x points should I have? I should have six because I have six faces, and so therefore I am going to the six sides. I have six x points. Now, if I go along the diagonal, if I go along the diagonal, I will hit a hexagonal face. How many diagonals do I have going from the center? Well, I have eight. Is that right? 
because I have eight corners. And if I start from the center and trying to join them, eight, cor eight lines, and therefore I have eight points. So I have, is that right? One, two, yes. So A, I have eight, and the distance from the gamma point, the center point, is 0.872 pi over A. Does it look complicated? Actually, not really. This is square root of 3 over 2, right? 0.87 is square root of 3 over 2. Why did the square root of 3 come? Because you have, in order to go along the diagonal, body diagonal, you have 1 x side, 1 y side, and 1 z side. That gives you square root of 3, but you are going from the center to the end, not the end to end. So therefore, you have square root of 3 over 2. That's 0.87. Okay, and then there are this all sorts of other points going from gamma to x halfway in between, you call it delta, and all sorts of other points. You will do a complicated homework next time. And when you do that, you will learn all this very clearly about how to use them actually. Now you are learning how to define them, but how to use them, you will see. Okay, this is an important point that people often miss that for this lattice, it is not pi over a to the n, but 2 pi over a. Okay. Now, I haven't really solved the problem. I'm saying solution reside in this Brillouin zone. So that means at every point, I'll have to see whether there is a solution or not. That's coming next. Now, before I get there, let me just give you an analogy so that you can understand this complicated diagram. You know, many times we see pictures like this in children's books. Like this is from my daughter's, daughter's book. She is in fifth grade or fourth grade. And this is a picture that I took. She's learning about art and other things. And so what is plotted here is a fourth dimensional information in some way. Density at every point as a function of x, y, and z. In fact, the solution we are going to look into, energy, as a function of kx, ky, kz is very similar to that fourth dimensional information. So if I could actually understand how to represent this information in a simpler way, then that I will apply also to the ek diagram. How would I do that? Well, one simple thing to say that this is a very difficult thing to draw and also it's difficult to read off even. So one thing I could do, I could take a theta, theta 1, and phi 1, and I could take a cut along that line, and I could say density as a function of r, as a function of the radial coordinate, changes in a particular way along that theta 1 and phi 1. Now, if I represented this theta 1 by a set of angles, right? and phi ones and also by a set of angles. So take this cut along a whole series of lines. In that case, I could plot, let's say, 50 of them. And by then two-dimensional projections, I could essentially capture the information that I have in the four-dimensional plane, right? Do you see this? Now you see the problem is much more, less complicated, much less complicated because remember I just said 148 of the whole thing because of the symmetry is all you care about. So in fact, you wouldn't need a 100 cuts. Only a small piece, if you could represent it by these two-dimensional cuts, that's all you care about. Okay, now let's see this in the next slide, how it, how it works out in real crystals. So again, just very quickly, so this space, just like x, y, z are the three coordinates, over there, kx, ky, and kz are the three coordinates. And we, just like here, we are looking for density. On the other one, we'll be looking for energy, that energy at every point. If there is a band gap, there will be no energy in that kx, ky, kz. Okay, so now, just like I said, because it's a complicated thing, it's difficult to draw that picture, four-dimensional picture over there we would rather take a cut along a line and plot it. So the first plot I am showing you is going from gamma to x point along that line. And along that line, you see on the right-hand side for germanium, 
I have shown you also a corresponding sol solution of the Schrodinger equation from gamma to x point. Now you will notice that below I have written 1 0 0. Why is it I say 1 0 0 here? It's of course 1 0 0 direction but didn't we define all these things in a real space? Remember the crystals? It was all the planes of the crystals and other things we represented it. Here of course this is not real space. These are reciprocal space. But of course vector doesn't matter. Here 1 0 0 is not the same 1 0 0 as the other one. The other one was 1 0 0 perpendicular to real space planes. Certain x, certain y and certain z. Here it is certain kx, certain ky, certain kz. So these two don't confuse. These are not the same thing. This is same direction is the same but of course in a different space. Okay. So going from gamma to x I see that I have plotted a bunch of solution. Now this is not all. Just like in one dimension I had four bands remember? Four meaning actually I had quite a few I just plotted four. Similarly here what they do they have just plotted the ones that are important for electrical engineers. There are bands below this there are bands above this and the bands that have been plotted are close to this 3s and 3p levels. This 1s, 2s, all those levels, those have not been plotted. 3s and 3p are the plots that have been shown here. You can see a few features. For example, in the one dimensional case, everything was going first if it's going concave up, the next one was concave down and this sort of alternated. But you can see here on the bottom side, the two bands, both are concave down, right? So in three dimension, when you have a complicated material, it's no longer necessary that that alternate route should follow. Similarly, you can see that there are other bands and we will learn about them uh, a little bit later, shown here on the, uh, this is above zero. So 1 EV or 2 EV and most of the time we will be only be concerned with the bands between let's say minus 1 to plus 1 or plus 2 EV. Nothing more than that. We don't really need anything more for the time being. But the point is this is a one section of the solution along gamma x. How to use them? We'll come back. Now let's say I want to draw it in another direction. So let's say I want to draw it along that direction, gamma to L. Now that's another direction. So I again should have another panel of solutions, right, in 2D. I'll have another panel and you can see gamma to L shown here in the bottom. Do you also see 1, 1, 1 written there? Shouldn't it be 1, 1, 1? Because it is going along the body diagonal. So of course it should be 1, 1, 1. Of course, the gamma to X and gamma to L has been drawn approximately the same, but of course not the same. Remember 0.87 was the uh, actual direction in, along the body diagonal. So the point is that these are just representative things. When you actually draw calculation or do calculation, you will have to remember that all sides are not the same. Gamma 2x and gamma 2l, they might be different. And you can see also the band look very different. The solution along the diagonal is actually very different than solution around gamma to the x point. We'll use them a little bit later um, also. These characteristic features of how bands look, these are essentially all generic. Always remember the plots that you see is only part of the solution space that are irrelevant for electrical engineers. There are other for opto, there are people who work on the optoelectronics and other fields they might be interested in completely different bands. So in that, in their book, you will see the same thing, but focused on a different region. Let's compare. So you can see germanium, silicon in the middle, gallium arsenide on the top. More or less what you see on the bottom side below zero, this, this EV, V stands for the valence band, where most of the electron states are occupied, a few holes exist. In that case, you see all three materials, because these have the diamond lattice or zinc blend lattice, right? They are very similar, so their band structure also look very similar. Other material will have other band structures. 
you can see in the valence band side there are two or three bands so here for example there are two or three bands and for all of them more or less the same information and we'll also uh, see for the conduction band side it is more complicated but the only thing i want to emphasize in here is the notion of a band gap do you see that it is the okay so definition of a band gap is the minimum point maximum point in the valence band and the minimum point in the conduction band they may or may not occur at the same wave vector point for example if you look on the gallium arsenide side you will see that let's say the maximum of the valence band is looking like it is at zero zero ev if you look on the left hand side on the other hand the minimum value for the conduction band also occurs at the gamma point the k equals zero point and you can see that it occurs since it occurs at the same point therefore this is a direct band gap material why it's called direct i'll i'll come back in a, in a second but this is a direct band gap material only light can directly excite this electrons in a gallium arsenide but if you look at silicon or germanium what you will see that the maximum point for the valence band occurs at k equals zero gamma point you can see that but what does it occur for silicon where does it occur uh, for the minimum occurs for the conduction band it occurs along the x point remember the six phases so it occurs close to that that point and since it is not occurring in the middle panel since it is not occurring at the same k point it is an indirect band gap material similarly germanium would be an indirect band gap material but the lowest point in the uh, in the conduction band is along the l point because you can see from that picture where this written eg and again this germanium will be an indirect band gap material okay so these are some of the features there is something called a split off valence band there are two valence bands on top of each other you can see and then one is a slightly so as if it has split off from the group and so there is something called a split off valence band very important the laser semiconductor lasers that you work with when you talk in telephone most of them actually have to account for that valence band otherwise you cannot design lasers so very important obviously for indium phosphide systems and many other systems for optoelectronic properties okay now let me let me move on to the other points now i want to uh, say a few more things uh, about uh, about this uh, gallium arsenide one just as a matter of definition you need to understand the definition clearly because then we'll be just using them often saying oh something is happening in the gamma point uh, there are in the x point some you have to then remember all these definitions so that there's no confusion right definition of the language uh, you can see that there are this gamma point but there is a subscript like gamma 6 and then there are x6 l6 so then this is just to say that the six subscript essentially is saying that there are six such bands as we'll see but the more important thing is that they all belong to the same band you can see l6 gamma 6 and x6 they will all belong to the same point and similarly you can see gamma 8 and correspondingly each is sort of just to indicate that they belong to the same band they'll have the same index and in this particular case you can another thing is important to see for gallium arsenide is that the l point and the x point for this one is actually very close to the gamma point within about 0.2 or 0.3 ev now for many 35 semiconductors that is true that the gamma point the difference between gamma point and l point and that of the x point is actually very similar and that's very important in terms of electron transport properties in about lecture 13 or lecture 14 i'll have to come back and see the implication of this we'll explain the implication of this at that point uh, for, for the carrier transport 
Okay, so that's one way of looking at it, right? EK diagram where you do the panels. The other way to look at it is constant energy surfaces. You remember in 2D, that's another way of looking at it. So for example, at a given energy, or for example, at a constant density, these are like contour plots. So at a constant density, you can say how the kx, ky, and kz, how they essentially change across the constant energy plane. And in fact, if you wanted to represent the original plot, original density plot, you would do a series of constant density uh, plots, and that will give you an idea about how the original structure in four dimension, how it was changing. So the corresponding one is shown here. Now this picture and the EK picture are exactly the same. We'll have to, we'll do a homework in which we will go between this one and the previous one. Same picture actually, because you are representing this E as a function of Kx, Ky and Kz in two different ways. So of course they are the same. So let's focus on the germanium one. Germanium, do you remember, I said that the minimum occurs at the L point, right, in the previous picture. And you can see along the 1, 1, 1 direction. And you can see the constant, the constant energy surface at low energies, essentially they occur along the 1, 1, 1 direction. For silicon, where did they occur? They occur along the X point. And so you see that they have the constant energy surfaces along X band. And why did it occur in gallium arsenide? On the gamma point. These are all conduction bands. So therefore, we have one band there occurring in the one. And you can represent it mathematically by those energy versus wave vector relationship. And from those, you could calculate the effective mass, right? Because effective mass is the second derivative. Here I show you i and j. In fact, it will represent, what should it represent? i could be x, y, and z. So if I wanted to know that how would electron go in the x direction, right? What should I do? I will make i equals x, j equals x. So it will be a second derivative of energy with respect to kx. I can take a derivative from there and I can calculate what the various effective masses are. That if it has to go in different directions, at what mass should it go? Very simple, right? You can see. Now, in case if it is more symmetric, like in gallium arsenide, you know, it's like a little sphere. So you can see the effective mass in all three directions should be the same, right? And there should not be any off diagonal term, which is dkx, dky, if you see, if you try to take a second derivative with respect to 1 and then 2, so if you take a first derivative with respect to 1, you see the 2 and 3 will go out, right? Then if you try to take another derivative with respect to 2, even the 1 will go out. So no of diagonal terms. Do you see this? And so you can see the only effective masses you will have along x direction, y direction, and z direction, they are the same, equal to 2a, no off-diagonal component. What does it mean of not having an off-diagonal component? What does it mean? It means that if you apply an electric field in x direction, electron will not try to go in the y direction. If you have off-diagonal component, generally that's true, right? If you apply an electric field in x direction, electron should go in the x direction. But Sometimes if you have off diagonal component, what will happen? You are trying to put a force in x direction, but the electron's wave space is such, or energy space is such, that x direction is blocked. So it sort of goes through along a channel in the y direction. And so in those cases, the transport will be more complicated. Not in this case, not for this material. Okay. Now, in constant energy surface, one thing to notice that, let's say this is for which material is it? This is for germanium, right? Germanium has along eight of the body diagonals. And, but one thing you have to be worried about is that you shouldn't just take eight. You have to take half of eight, four, because this constant energy surfaces, only half of it 
is inside the Brillouin zone. Remember, anything inside the Brillouin zone are the real solutions we are interested in. Anything outside, we don't care about. So therefore, in this case, half of this space, you see. So I, this is the EK diagram and this is the corresponding constant energy surface. I have L point is the minimum point, so I have drawn eight L ellipsoids on the constant energy surface. However, you can see the minimum occurs exactly at the L point. So therefore, the minimum of the energy also occurs exactly on the surface. So the surface cuts it into two. And therefore, you have only four effective ellipsoid inside the Brillouin zone. You see that? Okay, so let's try out another thing where the result is not exactly the same. Okay, now this one uh, for the valence band, I was expecting a silicon one, but th that's fine. Uh, for the valence band, you should check out for silicon. Silicon is slightly different, but uh, for the valence band, the valence band can be more complicated. You can see that the structure is more complicated. And in that case, even, uh, you can represent the E and a K. You cannot do it as simply as it was before, and you have a slightly more complicated relationship. In fact, this can be analytically derived. In your advanced courses, you will learn how to analytically derive them. But do you see here that there is a possibility that not only you will have diagonal terms, right? Second derivative with respect to x, y, or z, but you can also have off-diagonal terms here, right? Second derivative of e with respect to kx and ky. Do you see? You have off-diagonal terms because in this case, once you apply an electric field, once it tries to get around here, it may not have any space to go. It will have, may have to come out in a different direction. And therefore, there are off-diagonal terms in the valence band, but not necessarily in the conduction band. And that was the, the corresponding to that point. This valence band looks so complicated in, in that point. Now let me talk a little bit about, all theories are good. You know, theory people like them uh, to calculate complicated things, but actually unless you measure them experimentally, none of these things are useful because theory people often make a lot of mistakes. So let's start with two things that you really need to know about. One is a band gap. Remember, if my calculation is correct, all the gap between energies, they should come out right. And if my calculations are correct, the curvature, which gives, is given by the effective mass, those should come out right. These two things I want to discuss now. First about band gap. Consider that that flat line in the middle is the Fermi level. Remember, we haven't explained it, but We'll discuss it later and focus on the blue point and let's say light has coming in. If light is coming in, that blue point, the photons are coming in, photoelectric experiment, remember? And what this will do, that light, once it comes in, the photon will be absorbed and that energy, if it matches, if it matches, and the electron will jump to the conduction band, right? That blue point. And when, it's ju when it jumps, Light has been absorbed, so if I'm looking on from the other side, all of a sudden I will see no light coming out. So I will see an absorption of light if the photon energy is right. So I'll see an absorption in light, and that will tell me that there must be two bands. Now here I say two and three, but in general, pair of bands are, are, are here. If a photon of a slightly different energy comes, well, I cannot, the blue point cannot do anything anymore because it does, if it tries to jump, it doesn't find a receiving state. But the red point, which I just showed, that might have a right match. And in that case, that electron will jump. But one thing I want to point out here immediately, that between state one and two, there cannot be any absorption because both states are full. You see, electron, when it jumps, it has, it has to have an empty receiving space. So, only thing this experiment is going to tell you are the between states that are full, partially full at least, and partially empty. The ones that are important for transport. If the states are completely full, let's say bottom, lower level states, those will not participate 
in this absorption process. So we are getting the right band gap that we are interested in. So you see the rate point and you can continue doing this experiment and if you continue doing the experiment you will see that there is a corresponding energy spectra uh, that is absorption spectra and do you see how this might come about? The bottom point you see because that's the lowest energy gap. The green point corresponds to from the edge on the one side jumping up all the way to the top not the green point over there and that's the green point here and then there will be a gap because electrons from the two cannot go to four directly. There is much a gap in between. So there is a corresponding gap here. And then the starting with four, the another band will continue. Now one signature, I will explain all this later on, of a direct band gap material is that the absorption spectra must go with square root of E. Right? So E being the photon energy. On the other hand, if it is an indirect band gap material, what are indirect band gap? Silicon, germanium are indirect band gap material, right? So in that case, you will see a slightly different feature that it has this complicated shape that goes with the square of the gap. I haven't explained it. I will explain that later. But for the time being, if you see in your experiment that this is happening, then you know that this is direct uh, band or indirect band gap material. Another thing to see is that when we talk about solve the Schrodinger equation, there is no notion of a temperature, right? There is no temperature because all the atoms were sitting still in their place, A apart and everything. But if you allow the electrons to essentially vibrate at higher temperature, the band gaps that people calculate, so at 300 degrees C, 600 degrees C, then they are not just A apart, they are vibrating a little and the band gap that people calculate, for example, look at silicon, at very small temperature, zero degree, it was about, let's say 1.2 EV. As you raise the temperature, electrons are vibrating and the bands are spreading out a little bit, the problem that we have not solved and in advanced courses they do, by 600 degrees C, you can see the band gap is getting close to one. So as a function of temperature, which we have not accounted for so far, the band gap changes and it's an important change to account for, for de actual devices. Now, finally, I have three more slides and we'll talk about how to measure effective mass. Now, in order to ma uh, measure effective mass, we have to do a second experiment. First one was absorption experiment the second experiment. And the experiment that we have to do is sort of the following. What, what are we trying to get at? We are trying to get the curvature of the band gap of, of a particular band near the bottom. Because that is how fast the electrons move when you apply an electric field. So that's what we are trying to get. And on the other hand, which is equivalently, we are trying to get the curvature for these ellipsoids because that gives us the effective mass along a particular direction. So this is how what the next measurement is. Very elegant actually. You see what they do, they have a microwave source at 24 gigahertz, around 24 gigahertz. They fix it. So I have a device, a microwave is coming to that device with 24 gigahertz. Then they put a magnetic field with a knob, let's say. I mean, I'm just simplifying it. Now, do you know that anytime you put a magnetic field on a semiconductor material, the electron starts going around it. Cyclotron frequency, right? That's cyclotron frequency. Now, once it starts going around it, of course, it's going around it at a certain frequency. Now, the point, exactly at point when that frequency matches with the microwave frequency, 24 gigahertz. Let's say at some point it's going at 24 gigahertz per second, right? So, you will see from the other side, all of a sudden the microwave signal has been absorbed because it's like a pendulum. When pendulum is swinging, when my, I push my daughter in a swing, then when she is swinging at the same rate that rate I am pushing, then it's exactly the amplification is maximum, right? Absorption is maximum. So from the other side, you will not see any microwave coming out. There will be an absorption of microwave. From that, I know 
that my field, magnetic field is right, uh, right value, which is giving me this 24 gigahertz frequency, right? Okay. Now let's see the next step. What you will first see in this experiment, that first there will be an absorption. But then a little bit later, when will that absorption be? Think about gallium arsenide. So now if you have the valence band, now in the case of a valence band, what's going to happen? They have a slightly different mass, right? So they are going to go at a slightly different point. You may have to use a slightly different magnetic field in order to push it at 24 gigahertz. And so at that magnetic field, there will be another absorption. And just by looking at these two absorption peaks, you can figure out what is the conduction band effective mass and what is the valence band effective mass by using this formula. The frequency, what is that? 24 gigahertz, nu naught. And I'm going to derive it, the equation in a second. It is proportional to B naught and inversely proportional to M star. And you can see that if I measure a B conduction for the conduction at which there was an absorption peak, the red one, let's say, I know nu naught, 24 gigahertz. I know the effective mass for the electrons. And similarly, I put B val, which is for the valence band, and divide it out, I get the valence band effective mass. If it matches with the theory, my theory is good. If it doesn't match, theories should have to go back and do their work again. How does that equation come about, which I used? Very simple, actually. Don't get confused by all this. You see, when something goes around, you have a centripetal force. That's the M star V squared divided by R naught. You know this formula, right, from college. And when you have a magnetic field and the electron moving at a velocity v, you have the Lorentz force on the right, v cross bz. Why z? Because the magnetic field is in a vertical z direction and the electrons are moving in xy plane. You multiply, you will get u v bz, right? From that, can you calculate v? On the left hand side, v squared and right hand side, v, you can calculate the value of v. And if you know the velocity it's going around, then what will be its frequency? Very easy, see, whether you understand this. The time to go around the circuit is 2 pi r naught divided by v. 2 pi r naught is the distance it has to cover in a single shot. v is the velocity. So this is the time it takes to complete one circuit. And that is given by the first equation uh, in the blue, blue uh, background. Then, if that's the time, what's the frequency? If one circuit takes a certain time, let's say one nanosecond, then it's the inverse of that. That tells me the frequency. That's the new naught, and that immediately gives me the formula I am after. That's it. So essentially, I can then calculate from this formula, it is telling me that if I know new naught, microwave source 24 gigahertz, and if I know B naught, the point at which the whole thing is in resonance, then I can calculate M star. And that is what, can you understand from here also, that remember I had four bands, partially filled, partially empty. Why wouldn't I get any information about band one? Because band one is completely full. Electrons cannot go anywhere. They want to move, but they cannot move. Band four, no electrons. Of course, there nothing will move. So the ones that will move are exactly the ones that we are interested in, that are either partially full or partially empty, because then the electrons can go around, changes k value, changes velocity. You see? So let me conclude with on this one that we have talked about EK diagram and constant energy surfaces. Now these are Original thing is four dimensional, complicated to draw, but we draw these panels of information along a particular direction like X point, the L point, to represent the information. We always look at a particular energy range, right? Not the full thing, depending on which, what we're interested in. For um, germanium, for silicon, we are particularly interested in, in bands close to 3S and 3P. If you go back and see the top electron levels, that is where the 3s and 3p levels would be. And these have all same energy. Yes, 3s, 3p, and they mix. 
And because they mix, this is called hybridization, sp3 hybridization, therefore the band looks so complicated. You know, there's going, some going up, some going down. It's no longer as simple as one-dimensional uh, chronic penny model. Now, as I said, the EK diagram and energy diagram contain equivalent information, and you should learn how to use them in everyday work. Because for new, many new materials, you cannot just take a M star from looking at a book. Many times you'll have to go to a theory friend and ask, okay, can you draw, calculate the band structure for this particular material? Completely new material, let's say you are your advisor and you are working on. In that case, from that material, you'll have to extract this M star information. And you will do a homework that will clarify this concept. And finally, experimental measurement two, right? One is microwave absorption measurement for effective mass and the optical absorption experiment to get the band gap of the relevant one, the valence band and the conduction band that takes part in part, uh, conduction process. Those are the things you have to measure because without those, actually you don't know whether your theory is correct or not. Okay, so we are really getting close to finally getting to the transport problem, but let me end uh, lecture seven here.